is war. War and its masses. War and its men. War and its machines. Together they form the big picture. Welcome to the big picture. I'm Captain Carl Zimmerman. The big picture is a report to you from your army, an army committed by you, the people of the United States, to stop communist aggression wherever it may strike. The big picture traces the course of events in the Korean campaign through first-hand reports of our combat veterans, and through film taken by combat cameramen of the armed forces produced by the Army Signal Corps. These are the men who daily record on film the big picture as it happens, where it happens. Today, our big picture will show the United Nations forces counterattack against the Red Spring Offensive. You'll see our troops advance in spite of the spring mud and rain. With support from our air, artillery, and naval forces. And later, you'll meet two veterans of the Korean fighting, Chaplain Joseph Murphy and Captain John Rock, who saw, as it happened, a part of the big picture. Now, let's go back to May 20th, 1951. By 20 May, the second phase of the Red Spring Offensive has been thrown back along the entire front, with the last gap closed on the Eastern Front near Hang Yi by 24 May. The UN counterattack is launched immediately, driving the communists in full retreat. By the beginning of June, the pursuit, spearheaded by armored columns, has carried the Allies across the 38th parallel into North Korea, where the enemy braces and halts their retreat, forming a defense triangle anchored at Chorwon, Kumwa, and Pyongyang. By 15 June, UN forces crack the heavy red defenses in their so-called Iron Triangle, taking Kum Wa and Chor Wan and advancing north to Pyongyang. During the week 13 to 20 June, the communist air power becomes more aggressive, but suffers heavy losses to the UN air arm. During this period, the line undergoes minor changes as the ground phase subsides to patrol action and sporadic encounters. units push northward along the entire front as the tide of battle changes decisively in Korea. A tank infantry force takes up the pursuit of the exhausted Reds who bogged down in the second stage of their unsuccessful spring drive. The enemy, who has suffered huge losses in men and materiel, is retreating toward North Korean mountain strongholds. Withdrawing along a front of more than 100 miles, Red units find themselves under constant attack from the well-organized UN troops. Enemy lines of supply and communication are placed under continuous aerial and artillery bombardment. Here, the infantrymen prepare to blast the Reds from still another hilltop with coordinated fire and high explosive shells. smash an enemy-held hill position. Thank <laughs> you. 
muddy roads hamper the UN ground forces as they continue their offensive. The rapidity of the UN advance has cut off many large red units fleeing the attack from the south. Artillery crews must service their guns, bad weather or not. This unit, temporarily isolated from its supplies by a washed out bridge, waits patiently while ammo is in the process of being delivered to its frontline position. An airlift delivery of the artillery ammo has been decided on, and a break in the weather allows this resupply by air. Once considered an emergency measure, this method is now a routine logistical operation. The cargo planes, which have been dubbed by the soldiers as flying A-frames, come over in the drop zone, releasing more and more of the vitally needed ammunition. The delays caused by the strong torrential rains allow a great number of the retreating communist forces to escape north, but with their ammunition stores being constantly replenished, regardless of poor weather, UN artillery continues its heavy pounding of the enemy. The UN offensive is slowed temporarily, but continues moving into North Korea. Up to now on our big picture program, we have told you how our soldiers are the best equipped and the best trained. Now we'd like to tell you how that soldier becomes the best informed. With me is Captain John Rock, who is a company commander with the 1st Cavalry Division in Korea and is now with the Office Chief of Information Department of the Army in Washington. Well, John, tell us about this I&E program. How does it fit into the big picture? Carl, the Information and Education Program of the Army has as its objective to make our soldier the best informed soldier in the world and to raise the educational standards of the Army. Now, actually, we have two programs here, the Information and Education. That is true. Tell us how this soldier becomes the best informed. Well, in Korea, which is the topic we're most interested in at the present time, Carl, the soldier has the, um, the Army's information radio service, which brings him news not only of what is going on in Korea, but what is going on all over the world. The program has, is on the air continuously for about 23 and a half hours daily. Then, too, he has various publications. The biggest one, of course, being the Stars and Stripes. Here I have a copy. The Stars and Stripes are brought down to the troops on an average of about one to every five men. You'll see the map that's on this, Carl. It gives the man an opportunity to see exactly where he fits into the big picture. Well, you've told us about newspapers, radio. In what other ways is the soldier informed? Upon rotation off the front line, when it is possible, the commander holds what is known as a command conference. And these conferences are based on an armed forces publication known as the Armed Forces Talk. Here is a copy of one. This particular talk is entitled Communism, the what and the how. The man is told of communism, what it has done, and how it is working. Then he is given an opportunity to express his own views concerning communism and to ask questions concerning the subject. Now, how about the other part of this program, John? How is the soldier educated? Well, Carl, the education program is divided into two parts. First of all, every soldier in the Army must have the equivalent of at least a fifth grade education. If he does not, he must go to school and secure it. That particular part of the education program is mandatory. Every soldier must have the equivalent of at least a fifth grade education. That's just the basic requirement. That is the basic requirement. Over and above that, the soldier is given an opportunity to advance himself in education by taking either extension courses or attending some of the universities which have been set up within the theater so that he can advance in education. Well, now, John, you were a company commander in Korea. First of all, the, the mission of the Army is to win battles, right? That sure is. Well, now, how does this fit into making this soldier a good fighting man? Carl? We can never have a good fighting man unless he knows what he is fighting for and why he is fighting. 
and through the information program and the educational program, that message is being brought to the soldier. And by getting it, he is becoming a better fighting man. Thank you, John. And now let's watch the soldier as the UN offensive in May and June of 1951 goes on. An artillery battery prepares for a fire mission to aid UN forces in their counterattack. The men assemble a newly arrived shipment of 155 millimeter howitzer shells for their powerful weapon. Each shell weighs 97 pounds. After stacking the shells, fuses are screwed on. The breech block is carefully cleaned and oiled during the lull between fire missions. This outfit has fired over 130,000 rounds in support of infantry expending over 6,240 tons of shells. Here, the artillerymen adjust the equilibrator springs to balance the muzzle. Acting as a team, the men move swiftly to load the pieces. Last second fire adjustments are completed and the big guns go into action. As Allied units move northward, strong emplaced positions are constructed to fend off any red counterattacks. The men await the order to press on and maintain contact with the retreating enemy units. The UN forces swiftly adapt themselves to the hilly Korean terrain. Infantrymen conceal themselves with automatic weapons in the deeply emplaced bunkers. A 75 millimeter recoilless rifle is put to a thorough cleaning. Lieutenant General Frank Milburn visits front areas, getting a first hand view of the pursuit of the fleeing Reds. The men jump off, continuing their part of the Allied counterattack. UN infantrymen, well armed and well supplied, are capturing large hauls of enemy prisoners for the first time in the Korean War. During this period, enemy prisoners number 10,000, more than three times as many as have surrendered since Red China's intervention. The enemy gives up rapidly the terrain it cost him so much to capture. The advance continues as mine detector teams search for mines scattered in the roads and paths by the somewhat disorganized foe. Out of curiosity, one soldier glances at a red surrender pamphlet purporting to contain pleas of captured UN soldiers. From an observation post, supporting fire is directed against red strong points. Mortars are set up and zeroed in. The troops strike another heavy blow against the retreating enemy. At this time, while the fighting was going on, there was a very popular jeep rolling around the front lines that was called Life with Father. This was the jeep that carried Father Joseph Murphy of Cambridge, Massachusetts, around the 24th Division area. 
Let's find out what life with Father was like. For here is Father Joseph Murphy. Well, Father, uh, duty in Korea for a chaplain was a good deal different than duty back here in the States, wasn't it? Uh, that's correct, Kyle. It was different in the sense that we didn't have the regular ecclesiastical appointments as we understand them. Uh, a church building, an altar, candelabra, and uh, secondly, of course, there was a war on. And, uh, however, for all the uh, differences, there were very definite similarities. Uh, similarities in the sense that we were fundamentally doing the same type work, uh, caring for the religious and the moral welfare of the men. Uh, again, back to the differences for all that there were, uh, we did try to utilize uh, whatever was available in order to make the men feel, feel more at home in their uh, religious worship. Uh, to give you a couple of illustrations, I recall at one time we had an airdrop, and uh, the men uh, salvaged a red nylon parachute for me. Uh, we patched it together, and then we used to spread that over the hood of the jeep when uh, celebrating mass. And again, we had a, a little gal friend in Korea. Uh, she was known affectionately by the soldiers as Our Lady of the Foxholes. And uh, when we, we had a mass or a rosary devotion, would give her a very prominent position. Well, Father, she seems to have lost part of her halo. Uh, yes, she has, Carl. And I suppose it's only fitting that, inasmuch as so many of her men were wounded by the war, that she too carry at least one scar. Hmm, that's well put, Father. Well, overseas, you got very close to your men, didn't you, Father? Uh, that's correct, Bob. The, uh, uh, Carl, rather, it was a question of uh, <laughs> the one family, and we're all undergoing the same experiences. And uh, whatever came, it was the family, the men and ourselves together that mm -hmm. had that experience. Well, here's a question, Father. I'm sure all our viewers want me to ask you. Are there any atheists in foxholes? Uh, well, I must confess that after experience and career, I am convinced there are no atheists in foxholes. However, I will say in all honesty that it took two wars to make believers out of some of the men. Mm. Well, Father, um, you were at the front there, and the boys always weren't Catholic. There were other denominations there, too. Did you take care of all of them? Uh, yes, we did, Carl. Uh, we tried to, of course, to provide uh, chaplains of the men's own suasion, uh, Protestant and Jewish, but when such chaplains were not available, uh, then I would hold a general service for all the non-Catholic personnel. Mm -hmm. Certainly, Father, you've uh, conducted services in many different locations, too, haven't you? Uh, yes, in a variety of uh, sets, locations, in bunkers and the sides of roads. Uh, the thing is that no place was uh, too remote, no place was too small, no place was too bummed out uh, not to be utilized for a religious service. And many times, Father, you held these services under fire, didn't you? Uh, yes, Carl, occasionally we did. And uh, <laughs> to take care of those situations, uh, I used to have a, an artillery spotter present at the Mass. Uh, at the conclusion of the, uh, the Mass, the priest uh, turns to the congregation, he says in Latin, Ite Missa Es, which means the Mass is finished. Uh, well, now, during our Masses in Korea, uh, the artillery spotter uh, adapted himself to the Latin usage, and if there was any incoming artillery during the course of the Mass, he would immediately yell out, Ite Missa Es, which meant for him, and of course for ourselves, that the Mass was temporarily <laughs> finished and we all ducked for cover. And I bet it was never said with more emotion, Father. You're not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, about this soldier again, you said you got very close to him. What did you think of him, Father? Uh, the word for the American soldier is admirable, and I, I think, frankly, we should say, put it in the superlative and say most admirable. Uh, for the first few months in Korea, the American soldier was strictly a teenager of Bobby Soxer, and uh, when he considered the tremendous odds against him, the staggering hordes, and uh, the way in which he resisted not only defensively but offensively, uh, we have to stand in complete admiration of him. He's a wonderful fighting man, spiritually, physically. Well, you certainly knew his problems over there, Father. What were some of them? Uh, the, my experience has been that the men were primarily concerned with not the problems at the front, but rather with the problems at home. And of course, the distance from home multiplied those problems, as did the, a certain frustration, their inability to be uh, at home in the immediate future. Well, now, how can this be remedied, Father? Well, probably the most immediate way in which it can be remedied is by the folks at home uh, keeping the problems at home. The fighting man has enough to uh, concern him in the fighting zone without being unnecessarily burdened by the unpleasantries uh, back at home in the States. Where would you uh, most prefer duty, Father? In Korea, in, in a battle zone, or here in the States? Well, I think I'll 
parry that question with you by saying that uh, you prefer duty uh, with a nice group. In other words, uh, what makes a place pleasant or what makes a place unpleasant is not the geographic location, uh, but the crowd that you're with. That's all the difference in the world. Thank you, Father Murphy. Now let's go back and see the fighting as of May and June of 1951 in Korea. An air ground liaison team directs an F-51 strike as the Allies continue to move forward. Talking directly to the pilots, the ground unit helps the planes pinpoint the target. rises from the burning target as the Air Force helps smash the Reds in North Korea. As the UN attack continues, Allied troops open fire with machine guns on an enemy-held area. The fire is directed against a small house that harbors the enemy. Prisoners are taken as the troops move down into the valley. A wounded red soldier is captured. The troops push on against the reds who hold another hill beyond the valley. A powerful hail of steel is thrown into the enemy hill positions by quadruple mounted 50 caliber machine guns. communist force routed from the hill, the soldiers advance cautiously into the area to mop up possible stragglers. The men pause in their pursuit to have hot chow brought up to them in Marmite cans. The attack continues as the troops drive the last of the red force out of the area. The rocket ship loads ammunition for a night mission against Wonsan, North Korea. Purpose of the mission is to impede the southward movement of enemy troops along the coastal roads and blast red supply dumps and communication centers. The Navy adds its help to the UN's counterattack as the bombardment begins.
Those were the events that comprised the big picture from May 20th to June 20th, 1951. You heard about the mental and spiritual well-being of our troops through the words of our two guests. You heard about life with Father, with Father Joseph Murphy. And you heard about the Army's information and education program through Captain John Rock. Our thanks to Chaplain Murphy and Captain Rock for being with us. Our next week, our big picture will show the beginning of the Korean truce talks. You'll see our truce negotiators in the early meetings at Kaesong. And of course, you'll hear from two combat veterans who saw action with the 8th Army in Korea. This is Captain Carl Zimmerman inviting you to be with us then. Thank you.